pray for the gift of teaching now, Lord, and for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And give me wisdom, Father, in your word. I pray now in thy holy name. Amen. All right, turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 26 and verse 15 this morning. Deuteronomy chapter number 26 and verse number 15. And the scripture says, Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us, as thou swearest unto our fathers a land that floweth with milk and honey. So this is saying that the habitation of God is in heaven. Now I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 1. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the heaven, or heavens, is a part of the creation. Even the heaven where God resides, we call it the third heaven, is part of the creation. So therefore, it's obvious that God existed before the creation. He doesn't need a place to reside. He doesn't have to have anywhere. He, is, he resides within himself, within his own essence, because he's holy, holy, holy. But heaven is created for us, and it's created for the creation and creatures like seraphim and cherubim and angels and so forth. It, it's created for a purpose. And when God made heaven, in the Old Testament, he made it with a purpose in view. In other words, anytime God does something, he, doesn't, he never reacts to anything. Uh, when it says that the Lord repents in the Old Testament, that's talking about from man's perspective, as man sees it, as man understands it. It appears to man that God may have changed his mind, where the Bible says plainly in Ephesians 1, known to God are all of his works from the creation. Uh, but what you have here in the Old Testament is a, in the very beginning, it says that God created the heaven and the earth. And if you'll notice, it's not heavens, but heaven. Hashamayim is the Hebrew word. And Hashamayim, ha is Hebrew, is the definite article, the. Shamayim is the word for heaven. It's a plural Hebrew noun. And uh, im, words that end in im, Elohim, uh, seraphim. Words that end in im like that in Hebrew are plural Hebrew nouns, and they can mean three or more. And you notice that with Elohim, God, Elohim, that's a generic word for God, but it's also Elohim could be referring to gods like angels. It could be referring to spirit beings. So when Elohim or im or weren't ending in im, it means plural. So Notice that the translators in Genesis chapter number 1 took a plural Hebrew noun and translated it in the singular. They didn't say heavens, they said heaven. And of course you can do that with the rules of, um, of grammar because of the nature of Hebrew itself. In the beginning, gods created the heaven and the earth. Is that wrong? Well... God in Genesis 1 is also a plural Hebrew noun. It would be totally incorrect to say in the beginning God's created the heavens and the earth, wouldn't it? You'd have to say God, but it's a plural Hebrew noun. So I think you begin to understand what I'm saying in this. The three heavens that we understand are the first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. The third heaven can only be reached through a door. It's a place where God abides. And the only way you can get there is by a spiritual entrance into the presence of God and where He resides. Right now, the New Jerusalem, according to the book of, Genesis, book of Revelation, is in the third heaven. The second heaven is the one where the Hubble telescope was sent up so it could look off into the, into the light years and determine and view the creation. The first heaven is where you're breathing the air of right now and up for a little ways up above the stratosphere that covers this earth. 
That's the first heaven. But the second heaven, the stars, the, the, the cosmos, I guess you might call it, that's above us. And then the third heaven is the presence where God abides with His people. But if you'll notice in Genesis chapter number 1, it says, in the beginning God created the heaven. It didn't say heavens. What does that mean then? That lends to the idea that a three heavens, as we understand them, first, second, and third heaven, is something yet to be understood in a future sense because it's different. For example, when Satan fell, if you look at Ezekiel chapter number 28, if you'll turn there with me this morning. Ezekiel chapter 28. All right, now look at this verse uh, 13. Ezekiel 28 verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was, pre was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That word covereth literally means that he abides in a position of authority over other creatures. He had great authority. And he is a cherubim. And notice carefully, I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou didst walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. This is a reference to heaven because that's where Lucifer, Satan, came from. He came down from heaven and he was in the holy mountain of God. Now when you get in the book of Hebrews, you'll find that the, the writer of Hebrews makes reference more than once to the pattern of the things in heaven that the tabernacle was to be built according to the pattern that Moses received when he was on top of the mountain, when he was on top of Mount Sinai. God said, make all things according to the pattern. God showed Moses exactly what he wanted when he built the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, of course, is laid out in three distinct areas. Three distinct areas. The outer court, where the brazen altar is located, which had uh, most folks had access to that. They could bring their sacrifice and the priest would offer it up. Then there was the holy place, which was inside the tabernacle itself. And there you are drawing closer to God. You have a brazen altar. You have an altar, not a brazen, but an altar of incense, golden altar, inside the holy place, a golden altar, a table of showbread, seven golden candlesticks. You could go into that. That's the holy place, the kadosh, the kadosh, ha kadosh. Then you could go from there into the holy of holies. And once you got in there, you were standing between the cherubim over the mercy seat in the very presence of God. Now notice, you have three distinct separated locations and according to rank, you are allowed to go closer and closer as you approach God. Only the high priest could go into the third place and that only once a year and to offer sacrifices unto God. The third place, the holy of holies in the tabernacle corresponds to the third heaven where God resides right now, where he can be, uh, where, he, where, he, where he resides with his creatures in the third heaven. The reason that we are able to enter into the third heaven upon leaving this world is because one has gone before us and made it possible for all of us to go into the very presence of God and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, went into the third heaven. The second heaven corresponds to the holy place inside the tabernacle where you have an altar of, uh, of incense, you have a, a, ta a table of showbread, and you have a seven golden candlesticks. And the priest would go in there and minister daily, every single day. He would go into that holy place and minister unto the Lord. That's where Zacharias was when Gabriel showed up and told him he was going to have a son. He was in the holy place ministering unto God in the daily course. He was at the course of Abiah. And the first heaven, or the fir the, that corresponds to the second heaven, the first heaven has its correspondence with the brazen altar, which is outside. And that, of course, corresponds to Calvary where the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, 
gave himself as a sacrifice for us. The brazen altar was a place where the sacrifice was made. No sacrifices are made inside the holy place or the holy of holies. All the sacrifice, the sacrificial offerings are made outside in the first, uh, in, the fir in the court, which we would correspond to the first heaven. So the Bible says He appears in the presence of God for us. Now the heavens, therefore, are uh, set about to show man the, how that God is approachable, but only by those who are ready to approach Him. And the only way that you can become ready to approach Him is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, by the new birth. You cannot enter into the third heaven without the new birth. You must be born again. Well, the Lord Jesus said that to Nicodemus. Uh, it, of course, it had to do with the fact that you're saved, absolutely. But it has to do with far more than just being saved. And that's not to belittle being saved in any sense. That's first. You must be born again. You've got to be saved. But the new birth qualifies you for many things in the future and makes it possible for you to enter into the very presence of God. And so that's what the heavens are about. So in the Old Testament, when a saint died, he didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to heaven because he couldn't get in. As I told you before, you have to be born again or you can't even see the kingdom of God. Without the new birth, you, are a, you can be saved as they were saved. And salvation in the Bible is a, is, a, is a broad, used in a broad sense. But to be born again means that you have been changed. Your very nature, your essence has now been changed into the very nature of God. You have God dwelling in you. And you've literally been born of God. And none of the Old Testament saints were born like that. They weren't born again. So they couldn't go to heaven. So what happened to them when they died? They went to Abraham's bosom, which is another term for paradise. To the thief on the cross, he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And the scholars like to say, Yeah, and paradise is a word that Zoroastria used in Zoroastrianism. And it's found in other, uh, in, it's, it's found in other religions. And I answer, I answer that, that, that uh, skeptic and scholar like this. Every truth that any religion has, I don't care what, and some of them have elements of the truth, elements. Any element of the truth that any religion has is because they have received it from an ancient source. And that ancient source is the Jew and his word and the word that was passed down from them. And so the source of truth does not come through the Gentiles. It comes through the Jews. So now the third heaven cannot be approached. Nobody can go into the third heaven unless God does something that is different than what's laid out in the Scripture. And only two people in the whole Bible, two people ever were able to leave this world and go into the third heaven. One of them is Enoch. He was translated. He shouldn't see death. He went into the third heaven. The other one was Elijah. He was caught up in a chariot of fire. Went into the third heaven. When the Lord was on top of the Mount of Transfiguration and glorified, two people showed up on top of that mountain. Two people. And they talked to him about his exodus. That's the word that's used there. Exodus. That word means his departure when he was going to leave. And that was Moses and Elijah. And I believe they're the two that are going to show up in Revelation chapter number 11 and confront the Antichrist face on. And the Antichrist is going to be very, very angry at Moses and Elijah, and he won't be able to do a thing to them until their ministry is finished. And their ministry, of course, is to come and for the Jew, to verify to the Jew to prepare them for the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who they'll minister to. Because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And the law and the prophets brought together for the Jew in the tribulation points him to the king, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to come back. So heaven in the Old Testament was a place that was unattainable for the, for, for the Jew or for anyone else. They could not go into the third heaven. They had to go into Abraham's bosom. And so when they went into Abraham's bosom, they went into the heart of the earth. They went into the heart of the earth because that's the location of paradise, Abraham's bosom, in the Old Testament. 
Time and time and time again you'll read where an Old Testament saint dies and the Bible says they were gathered unto their fathers, gathered unto their fathers, gathered unto their fathers. But in the New Testament it says in the book of Ephesians that when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead that He led captivity captive. He emptied paradise and carried them into the presence of God. Now here's a peculiarity. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter number 6. This is a, a peculiarity. Revelation chapter number 6. He didn't do away with paradise. If you'll remember in Luke chapter number 16, when the rich man died, the Bible says that he lifted up his eyes in hell. And then what happened? He saw who afar off? He saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. As we said before, Abraham's bosom is the heart of the earth. He saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. That's where Lazarus was. Well, now, now Lazarus is at the right hand of the Father because he's been carried out of there. But God intends to use the place again. Look at Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation 6. And verse number, uh, let's see, where it says, I saw under the altar the souls. Verse 9. There you go. Thank you, brother. Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them, or those that had been slain for the word of God. In 18, or 17, 17, uh, I forget exactly the date. I think it's 96, 86, somewhere in there, the French Revolution took place. And the French Revolution is when the French people rose up against King Louis and overthrew the monarchy. They introduced something into France that was a, uh, to this very day, is, uh, it stirs the emotion. And what was that? It was the guillotine. They introduced it. And they cut the head off of Marie Antoinette. They would lead people through the streets of Paris, France on, on, on open carts that were headed for execution. And the people would throw things at them and curse them and all of this. The French uh, used the guillotine uh, extensively. They cut off a lot of heads. They decapitated people. And the guillotine was a quick, clean chop of a head. And you know, it's, it's not like uh, putting on somebody on a rack or a crucifying them on a cross. Uh, death was pretty well, was, was pretty fast. Like uh, Anne Boleyn when they cut her head off. Uh, Henry VIII, one of the most miserable monsters that ever lived, had his wife's head cut off. And she was only in her 20s, I think. And uh, they decapitated her. We believe that that's exactly what's going on here in Revelation chapter number 6. That they are cutting the heads off of people. They're decapitating them. Have you noticed what ISIS is doing? They've just decapitated a, a Japanese. They've got two of them, and, and they've just cut the head off of one of the Japanese. And the uh, Prime Minister of Japan uh, said that uh, this is, he said this, he said, I am outraged. I'm outraged that they would do that to our people. But in any event, it appears to me why that this is the method of execution that they choose is decapitation to cut their heads off. Now, of course, you know in the Quran it says to smite them above the neck. And that, of course, is what they're doing. They're, they're cutting their heads off. So when these people die in the tribulation period, what happens to them? Notice it says that I saw under the altar their souls. The altar here, more than likely, is an altar that is raised to the Antichrist. And these people are dying and they're being decapitated and their souls are under the altar but they're not in heaven. Why aren't they in heaven? Think about it for a minute. Why would he see them under the altar and not see their souls in heaven? The Apostle Paul said for us who are Christians in this age of grace, to be absent from the body is to be what? In present with the Lord, to be there with Him immediately. And he said, we know if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The reason they don't go directly to heaven in the tribulation is because something has changed in the tribulation. This is why he said he led, led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, but he didn't shut paradise down. It's still there. 
it's still there in the heart of the earth. And when these people die in the tribulation period, they are waiting for the coming of the Messiah to raise them up and shout their names and call them forth. And the reason for that is because they're not born again. You live in an age where you have been blessed beyond measure. To be saved in this age of grace is to mean, is me, means to be born of the Spirit of the living God. And the Holy Ghost comes into you and takes up dwelling, and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. He circumcises you according to the book of uh, Colossians chapter number 2, cutting your spirit and your soul away from your flesh. And the reason He does that is because you are no longer stuck to your flesh like an Old Testament saint, and you are therefore a candidate immediately for heaven the moment that you leave this world. The, moment, the very moment you leave it. Yes, ma'am. How long will it be before you avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's what he's talking about. They're crying for vengeance. When you get to the book of Revelation, everything changes. You'll notice that an angel flies through the heavens preaching the everlasting gospel, right? Now, what is that gospel? What does it say? In, what, do what now? There's nothing about the finished work of Christ. There's nothing about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's not a word about the blood of Christ cleansing you of your sins. What does he say? He said, fear God and give glory to Him. Keep His commandments. Statements like that. You say, well, now wait a minute. Didn't Paul say in the book of Galatians chapter 1, if I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, do you let him be accursed? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But if you don't rightly divide the Bible and set it in dispensations, you get in trouble. And I know a lot of good people out there, and they mean well, but they just mix the whole thing up and think that everything is talking to a church age saint. And the church age, they don't make a distinction between the church age and the Old Testament. They don't make a distinction between the gospel of the grace of God and the gospel of the kingdom. And they get into all kinds of trouble. And that's a shame because this gospel over here in Revelation chapter number, uh, where is that, uh, 14, 15, 16? where the angel flies through the heavens preaching the everlasting gospel. And I've heard preachers preach messages on the everlasting gospel as if that were the grace of God, and it's not. It's not. Tell me something. Can you find one passage in the Old Testament where it says that they are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they can be saved and that the blood of Christ will cleanse their sins away? No. No. But when the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, He died for the transgressions that were under the First Testament. It says it plainly in the book of Hebrews. In plain words, He died for all of their sins back in the Old Testament. They were faithful saints. They followed the light they had. But the work hadn't been completed until the Lord Jesus came. The tribulation period is a different period altogether. When they die, they don't go directly to heaven. They are in paradise and they will be there until Christ comes back at the second advent and calls them up and meets them. So the Bible says that the day is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of Man, or the Son of God, and come forth. I have a lot of folks out there today that believe in a general resurrection. They believe that when the Lord comes back, He's going to call up all the dead. He puts the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left hand. A lot of good people believe that, folks. They're good people. But they believe in a general resurrection. Sheep on the right hand, goats on the left hand, calls an end to it, and they enter into the kingdom. And when you, get to, when you start believing that, then you get into trouble. Because he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Yes, ma'am. Right. Look at the warning in Revelation 7 and 14. The warning is that if you take the mark of the beast, if you take that mark, there is neither forgiveness in this world, the world to come, the smoke of your torment will ascend up forever and ever. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says this about the people that are alive right now on this earth. If they love not the truth, believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie and be damned. 
Now that's what he says about the people alive right now. This is a principle that God applies consistently from Genesis to Revelation. For example, when Jonah went into Nineveh, he didn't find any churches in Nineveh. There weren't any synagogues in Nineveh. It took him three days to walk through Nineveh. It was a huge city. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which, who were the sworn enemies of Israel. But when God sent Jonah there to preach to them, he walked in, he started preaching, and he said, 40 days, God's going to overthrow this place. 40 days, and the judgment of God's coming. You know what happened in Nineveh? They called a fast. The king called a fast. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. And you know what God did? He turned from His wrath, and He turned it back to the ones who had the light. He's a merciful God. He's a merciful God, not willing that any should perish. The tribulation period, in my way of thinking, is a time when God sorts out a lot of things. He sorts them out that, uh, that haven't been sorted out. The Jew that's blinded in the tribulation period, he's blind now, but the scales are going to call, fall from his eyes. And his Master and Lord and his Lord God is going to come back. And they're going to look upon the one whom they have pierced, and they're going to mourn for him yeah. as one that mourneth for his only son. And they're going to say to him, where did you get these wounds? Where did you get these wounds? And he'll say, in the house of my friends. And all Israel, he said in Romans chapter number 11, shall be saved, for salvation will be in Zion. Your deliverer shall roar out of Zion. He'll come back to the Jew. That's where salvation is. Is salvation in Zion today? No. Is anybody being saved today because they see the second coming of Christ? No. Is anybody today asking, where did you get these wounds? No. How are they being saved today? By the power of the Holy Spirit of God as He goes out among men and He convicts them and He draws them to the Lord Jesus. The Bible, folks, gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's not as simple as a lot of people like to make it think. I have a problem with anybody who has a system worked out and he's got everything figured out. And when he goes to the Bible, he applies the Bible to his system. Instead of applying the, instead of instead of taking his system and apply and taking the and taking his system and let the Bible judge his system. He's got it all worked out. Uh, on the way over here this morning, uh, my wife told me she'd heard this preacher yesterday from the Apostolic Church. The Apostolic Church teaches that if you're not baptized in Jesus' name, now you've got to get this right. If you're not baptized in Jesus' name, you're not saved. Isn't that sad? Yes, ma'am. Oh. All right, now you've got the Church of Christ on one hand, you've got the Apostolic Church on the other. They both believe in baptismal regeneration. But one of them believes that you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the other one believes you're not baptized in the name of Jesus only. Okay? Now, there are those who teach that if you don't speak in tongues, that you're lost. Because tongues is proof positive you've got the Holy Ghost. I haven't heard that taught in a long time. But a lot of, there's a lot of folks out there that still teach that. That's preached in the church of God. Pardon? That's preached in the church of God. Yeah. Uh, but I know all Church of God preachers don't believe that. But uh, a lot, lot of them no doubt do. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Does anybody interpret it? <laughs> right. Well, it's the nonchalant attitude they have toward it. And when I first got saved, I was told that the, uh, I was told by a girl that, uh, who was a, who was a, uh, uh, she was either a church of God or assembly of God. But here's what she said. She says that the assemblies of God and the churches of God are a little different in this sense. And some, no doubt there's other differences, but here's the great difference. She says, you'll find that in the church of God, you may hear people speak in tongues, but you'll just hear them speak in tongues and there's no interpreter. But the assemblies of God, she says, are a little more strict about that. 
And they'll stick a little closer to 1 Corinthians 14, where it says that if you speak in tongues, you need an interpreter. Right? And so I visited the Assemblies of God. I visited the Church of God. I've been in Catholic Church. I've been everywhere. I've listened to them. I've sat through more masses than you can imagine. I've listened to everything under the sun. And I'm going to tell you this right now. He that hath the Son hath life. Amen. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. That's what it says. How do you get the Son? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Acts chapter number 16, I think it is, to the Philippian, Philippian jailer. How do I receive the Lord Jesus Christ? How do I believe on him? What happens to me? How do I get saved? How did you get saved? Oh, you know you're saved? Do you really know for certain that you're born again? One of the surest signs that you know you're born again is the Holy Ghost takes up residence within you. Now, how do you know the Holy Ghost is in you? A war takes place. You got in a war that's going to last until you leave this world. There's a war between the old man and the new man. I lived for 27 years and there wasn't any war. <laughs> But the moment I got born again, as soon as the glory wore off, it took a while for that to happen. It took a few weeks. I was working at Snyder Motors as a, as a Volkswagen line mechanic. And uh, for, I don't forget, two or three weeks after I got saved, man, I, I just float in and float home. I floated everywhere. I don't know what was going on around me. I was just floating. I'm a, just something so wonderful had happened to me. But, but it didn't take long. When the, when, the, when the initial glory began to wear off, that old man started raising his head again. And I said, where'd you come from? <laughs> I thought you were gone. And so the battle has raged since then. It really has. There's a, I don't know about you folks, I got a battle going on with me. I got the old man and the new man. Now, I didn't get that in a baptismal pool. I didn't get that in a baptismal pool. I got that when I got down on my face over there on Winwood Drive in 1973, and I bowed my head, and I said, Lord Jesus, have mercy on my soul. And man, I couldn't tell you, to, I could not explain to you the way I went down and the way I came back up again. It is just absolutely, you got to experience what I'm talking about. Because when I raised my head back up, it felt like something just flooded all over me. I felt clean. I was forgiven. I changed. Somebody moved into me that day that's never moved out. I had a desire immediately for the Word of God. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I wanted spiritual things. I wanted to go to the house of God. I wanted something from God. I had a hunger, a burning fire built within me instantaneously. My sins were forgiven. I was born and washed in the blood of Christ. And somebody comes up and tells me now, well, you better be baptized in Jesus' name. You're going to hell. How do you think that makes me feel? That's very offensive. That's offensive because I know what happened to me. He saved me and he changed me. Immediately when I raised my head, I knew something profound had happened. And nobody could have told me what to expect. There was a deacon from the church sitting there. He's the one who came over and read the Bible with me and prayed with me. That deacon was sitting on that couch and prayed with me. And I thank God for that witness and testimony. But I'll tell you right now, before he ever prayed with me, I went through days of horror. I'm talking about days where I didn't, I had never in my life experienced what went on inside my soul. I knew if I took a, if I knew if I died, I was going to go to hell. It was real inside me, a conviction like I'd never had in my life. I knew there was something between me and God that wasn't right. And when I bowed my head and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> I raised my head back up, buddy, that, that wall was gone. Glory flooded my soul. <laughs> Amen. Glory flooded my soul. <laughs> Amen. It did. I'm telling you. <laughs> but boy, the battle started after that. But like I say, it took about, I think about three weeks. And I'll tell you what I did, too. I had some Christians over there where I worked. And I sought them out. And they saw a change in me, and they sought me out. And we'd go eat lunch together. And we'd go eat lunch and talk about the Lord. And I guarantee you one thing, that other crowd around there, they got as far away from us as they could. Nobody wanted to go eat lunch with us anymore. Just the ones that were saved. They're talking about the Lord. That, listen, Jesus 
will pull you together or pull you apart. <laughs> He's a uniter and a separator. He'll unite those that love him and he'll separate those that don't. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I don't know how I got my job done. I don't know how I did tune ups, brake jobs, valve jobs. I don't, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> jerk a motor out and jerk the heads off of it and do a valve job on that thing. My mind wasn't a bit more on what I was doing than a man in the moon. How in the world? I got those cars fixed and out the door. And none of them came back, though. God was with me. <laughs> Amen. We, we used to call them comebacks when I, was, when I was a professional mechanic. A comeback is when you do a job and, uh, and then they bring it back and say, we got a problem. I built a motor one time. And uh, it was on the, well, the square back back then, the Volkswagen, they've, they've got a horizontally opposed engine. And I remember rebuilding the motor and got a phone call a couple of days later. And the guy said, my car is down here on University Avenue and the motor's locked up. I said, oh, me. <laughs> locked up. That means that the crankshaft won't turn. Like a lot of different things could cause that. But the motor was locked up. What did I have to do? I had to jerk it back out and rebuild it again. <laughs> I had to fix it. What, that's called a comeback. And we used to rate the mechanics. I don't know how in the world I got off of all this. <laughs> we used to rate the mechanics in the shop by how many comebacks they had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see a mechanic, a line mechanic working in the shop somewhere, and they keep coming back, come back, come back. Then the shop foreman goes up to him and says, Now, look, son, we got a problem here. You're not fixing these cars right, and it's showing up in your work. And so it was. But I, for three weeks, I floated. I floated. Anybody ever float like that? Yeah. Hallelujah to God. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Those are martyrs. Martyrs. You're talking about a martyr, someone who gives their life for Christ. Uh, well, it makes good preaching. It makes good preaching that there's a martyr's place up there in heaven. <laughs> a lot of things that make good preaching is not necessarily good doctrine. I don't know that the Lord has a place for martyrs separate from all of the born-again believers. I believe we're all in the same place at the throne of Christ. Yeah. Pardon now? Dress different. Well, in Revelation it talks about wearing white robes. And their white robes are the, are the righteousness of the saints. And that's a different thing altogether. Uh, I'll tell you what you'll be dressed with, I think, is what Adam was dressed with. Glory. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't know it. No, we won't. No. No, you see, Adam and Eve were created just the, the, just the flesh, and there they were. And, you know, you see the pictures of, of Eve and Adam, and here they are. She's naked, and he's naked, and she's offering him an apple and all of that. You know, that makes fine art, but that's got nothing to do with the Bible. They had a, they had a glory about them. And when they sinned, that glory left. And that was their covering. And when the glory left, then they could see they were naked. And that awakened a consciousness in them because they had taken the forbidden fruit. They knew the difference between good and evil. Now they're going to do something about it. What do they do? They took fig leaves and sewed them together to cover their nakedness. So fig tree from then on becomes a type of man's righteousness, his own righteousness. And they did that, and of course that didn't do the job. What did the Lord do when he came? He took the skin of a lamb, lamb skins, and he covered them. So our parents, the first clothing that God ever clothed anybody with was glory. But then when they lost the glory, he put lamb skins on them and covered them. But we go to heaven, the body that, uh, that we have now is corruptible. We'll have an incorruptible body. It's mortal. We'll have an immortal body. It's a body that's sown to decay and all of that. But the body we have then will be glorified. For, for John said, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, be covered with glory. There's nothing artificial in heaven. Nothing artificial. Nothing artificial. All right. We've got about five minutes left. Anybody have anything? Yes, sir. It's everywhere. Even the Jews had what's called a mikvah, but it wasn't for regeneration. It was for cleansing. 
When you go to the Temple of Jerusalem right now, you can find the mikvahs. I've seen them. It's a ritual bath that uh, cleansed the body before they could ascend to the top of the throne where God was, well, top of the Temple Mount where God was symbolically. It's everywhere. Baptismal regeneration is a pagan doctrine. Pagan to the soul. The only thing that can wash your sins away is Revelation 1.5. Somebody reach, turn there and read it for me. Revelation 1.5. That'll wash your sins away. And the new Bibles don't like it. So they change it. The Ganges. They go into the Ganges and they cleanse themselves. It's so sad. I feel sorry for these people. I don't have any contempt for them. They're ignorant. They, you know, they mean well. They know there's something wrong. But the, the Ganges River won't wash their sins away. What's it say in Revelation 1 5? In his blood. Washed your sins away in his blood. Mm -hmm. You know what the new Bible say in Revelation 1 5? He has loosed us from our sins. It's lauo and luo. And I forget which is which. I have to go look it up. But it's the two Greek words. One is lauo, the other one is luo. One means to wash, the other one means to loose. You all can, if you're on time, you can look it up, see which one is which. And the new Bibles say, loosed us from our sins. No, it didn't. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. So what can wash away my sins? That's what it says in the hymnal, doesn't it? That connects me with the generations that came before me, and they think just like I do. Yes, sir. Absolutely, brother. I confess that quickly. There's a lot of things I don't understand. They're blinded. Why would he blind them? Well, they spent their whole life, you know, that way on the wall praying to God. I know that. And then they died. I know that. But why would he blind them? That's the point. That's the answer to your question. He So that he could have mercy on them. That's why he blinded them. Live. That they might live. Absolutely. We might have life. Exactly. And through, their, through their fall, mm -hmm. salvation's come to the Gentiles. Yes. Not as an afterthought. It was already preordained. Last chapter of the book of Acts, he says, I go to the Gentiles and they will hear it. Yes. But it was necessary for me to come first to the Jews. Yes. And he quoted Isaiah chapter number 6 that says, Having ears to hear, they hear not. Eyes to see, they see not. Their heart hath they hardened. Yes. So therefore he turned from them and turned to the Gentiles. But he's, hath God cast away his people which he foreknew. Oh, Romans chapter number 11. That's how it opens. He has not. That's why paradise is still there, brother. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, because certain people die, they're not going straight to heaven. The only one that's going to go into the presence of God is that one that's born again. And only through Christ is the new birth. Absolutely. Yes, sir. There's no way that could be the grave. Most, most Gentiles have a real problem understanding what a debt we have to the Jew. We have an enormous debt to the Jews. We have a great debt to them. Our faith did not come from a Muslim. Our faith came from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob.
It shocks people when they hear that, doesn't it? Yeah, and they just, for me, and they just look at me like jumped out. They've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. But what you just said is true. All right, we'll have a word of prayer and let you go. And uh, pick up again next week. Brother Crane, will you dismiss us, please?